Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's uh, webinar on permafrost research, current activity, and future needs. I am uh, Nicole Bibo. I'm from the AVI in Bremerhaven, the Alfred Wigner Institute, and I'm the coordinator of EOPOLANET 2. <clears throat> Uh, within this webinar, we would like to provide uh, all of you an overview about uh, the EU Arctic permafrost research activities, the fields of study and the future research needs uh, in a policy relevant context. And the webinar takes place in the frame of EU Polarnet 2, as I already said, and Nuna Yatuk. Nuna Yatuk, yeah. Um, just a short introduction to both projects. So EO Polarnet is a two is a coordination and support action under Horizon 2020. It consists of 25 partners representing all European and inter and associated countries with polar research programs and activities. Um, and its main uh, duties are to coordinate European polar research activities and to support the European Commission in um, all their activities related to the polar regions and also to provide policy advice. And this webinar is a bit related to the policy advice in EU Polarnet. And the other project heavily involved here is Nuna Tayuk, I will learn it, which aims to determine uh, the impacts of thawing coastal and subsea permafrost on the global climate. It will develop targeted and co-designs adaptation and mitigation strategies for the Arctic coastal populations. And finally, be before we start with the talks, as I already said, this is a bit of policy related webinar is <clears throat> the reason why we have chosen permafrost is, of course, that it is so prominently mentioned in the European Arctic policy. And the policy mentions three important topics uh, for which further research on permafrost is needed. This is, of course, climate change, but also infrastructures, as over 70% of the Arctic infrastructures and 45% of oil extraction fields are built on permafrost. And then the third aspect are health aspects. Uh, in addition, the EU also recommends to um, develop further research on adaptation and mitigation measures uh, and increase the knowledge uh, on the impact of permafrost uh, on communities and sustainable development, sowing permafrost. So uh, this is a bit the frame of the webinar and uh, now just a short logistic uh, thing. So um, for all of you, you are, uh, who are listening, you are muted at the moment, so we ask you to uh, type all your questions into the chat. And we will ask them then after the three presenters have have given their presentations and you, but you can already permanently type it in and later on when we have the discussion session, then I will ask you uh, uh, to uh, if you have further questions related to your question. So, and then we can also unmute, unmute you. We will now start. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Paul Overdun from the AVI in Potsdam. <clears throat> Paul's research over the past few years has focused on permafrost beneath the ocean and along the Arctic coasts. He leads the uh, chemistry lab at AVI Potsdam, the water chemistry lab, and coordinates uh, the uh, EU Horizon uh, project, Horizon 2020 project, Nuna Tayuk, or uh, co coordinates it. Paul will focus in his talk on physical research activities within the projects from Framework Program 7 to Horizon 2020 and talk about the hot research topics for the upcoming times, the upcoming next near future. Paul, it's your duty. Thanks very much, Nicole. Um, I think I'll just get straight into it and share my screen. Does that work? Do you hear me and see my presentation? I see it very small. Mm -hmm. 
but maybe it's due to my I can no, it's my problem. No, I I can also only see it like it's a large black thing and then yeah. We also see the presenter view, so we also see your next slide, etc. So you do, so you see the presenter view. Sorry. Yes. Um I'll try it again. Okay, trying again. Is that any better? It's is is still the presenter view, but you can change it here at Genau. Now it's fine. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, thanks very much, um, Nicole, for the introduction. And um, I'm, it's my pleasure to start out this uh, morning's uh, webinar with a presentation on permafrost research. I'm going to start with a sh just a short introduction to permafrost for those of you who um, aren't familiar with it or are less familiar with it, and then go into um, where we're at in terms of permafrost research, especially in respect to, uh, to efforts that, that have been funded by um, the EU, by the, by the uh, EU programs. And what, what the goal is here with the three of us is to kind of talk about what current activity is going on, um, what it leads to, and what future needs there will be. And I think that some of that will come more out of the talks, I'm hoping, from Gustav and, uh, and Sousa. So just to go back to basics, um, there's a word called the cryosphere, which is kind of at the same level as biosphere or geosphere. Um, it's the frozen part of the earth. And if you think about the frozen part of the earth, you right away think about glaciers, usually up in the mountains, large ice sheets like Greenland or Antarctica. There's also ice that forms every winter and, and, and melts again in the spring on the, on the ocean or on rivers or on lakes. There's also snow. But what we're interested in here is the part of the earth itself that's frozen, not just frozen water, but frozen earth. And there's kind of two different types of that. There's the type, type that freezes every year, like here in Germany or, or uh, pretty much anywhere in temperate zones where the, the, the winter uh, causes the ground to freeze a little bit. And then there's the always frozen earth, which, which never thaws out or doesn't thaw out for years at a time. And that's what we call permafrost. And so what we're focusing on is this very large uh, fraction of the, of the, especially the Northern Hemisphere, um, more than 20% of the land surface uh, in, the, in the Northern Hemisphere that remains frozen all the time. And I wanna talk about why that's important and what we're doing about, about that importance. And that there's a couple of different levels that we need to talk about. Nicole mentioned um, the EU policy document that came out last year in which permafrost is identified as an important topic for its climate change relevance because there's a lot of infrastructure built on it and because of health implications that have become more and more apparent over the last few years. A couple of days ago or yesterday, I think the IPCC um, synthesis report for AR6 for the assessment report came out from the, uh, from the UN. And permafrost is mentioned three times and I just picked out what, what it says. Um, about what makes permafrost important in a climate context. And one is that we're approaching irreversible impact on Arctic ecosystems because of permafrost thaw. So the Arctic itself is changing, and we see that in a number of different ways, and I'll show, I'll show what, that, what that looks like. Permafrost itself, in terms of how widespread it is and how, how much volume it has on, on the Earth, is going to continue to decrease. We're already locked in um, to a decrease of permafrost. And this decrease will feed back into climate change and exacerbate the problem um, and increase the challenges that we face as a society, as a global society. So this is what just kind of came out uh, yesterday and underscores why we need um, to conduct permafrost research, um, because in the end, there are, there's a societal tie back, feedback. Um, and I think that's something that Gustav will talk about in his talk in more detail. I just want to put permafrost in the cryosphere in context first, uh, for, so bear with me. This will give you a, maybe a little bit of a different view of what permafrost is or why it's important or how important it is. So I'm just comparing the area, the comparative area of sea ice here at the top, which is quite large. That's the, the mean annual uh, extent of sea ice in the Arctic 
to the extent of permafrost in terms of million square kilometers. This is land permafrost to the size of the Antarctic ice sheet, the size of the Greenland ice sheet, and the size of all the gl glaciers in the world kind of taken together, um, just in terms of area. These different aspects of a cryosphere have an important role to play planetarily. They kind of form our air conditioning unit globally. Sea ice especially, it reflects light. If it's gone, the ocean water in the Arctic Ocean absorbs the light. So it's really kind of an on-off switch for the heat balance of the Earth in the north. And that's, that's something that we've seen since 2007 is decreasing in size uh, dramatically and outstripping our predictions. The ice that's caught up in glaciers and in, in, in ice sheets, Antarctica and Greenland, it doesn't really disappear from year to year. So you're not changing how much reflected light there is, but you are changing sea level. As they melt, they contribute directly to sea level increase. So they, their job in our, in our uh, Earth system is to store water. Permafrost isn't very reflective. We're not so sure about how much water it stores. And so really what, there's a different relevance for permafrost. Permafrost is kind of like our freezer uh, in the earth. We've put a whole lot of plant material into uh, permafrost over long time frames, tens to hundreds of thousands of years, um, even longer, millions of years. It's our freezer. And if our freezer breaks down, that carbon starts to rot and it starts to produce greenhouse gas. That's kind of the basic concept. And that's the way these different cryosphere uh, components are important to our global um, to our global climate system. There's one more thing that I kind of touched on, which is the storage of water, permafrost. Uh, we have some relatively new modeling results from Jan Nitzborn, who's mentioned at the bottom, who calculated how much ice is melting uh, in sea ice every year uh, from year to year. That's the net loss on Antarctica, Greenland, and glaciers. And um, the bottom part, Antarctica, Greenland, contributes to sea level rise. In permafrost, there's also a significant amount of ice being lost from year to year uh, due to thaw and, and to warming. It's not clear where that water is going, if it, if it ends up in the ocean or not. But you can see that from the amount of water, it's comparable to how much water we're currently losing, uh, ice we're losing from Antarctica. So there may be a sea level, a current sea level signal as well from permafrost. Given this importance of permafrost uh, for the global climate system, the EU began funding uh, permafrost research in a large way back in the framework program seven. I think in 2011, they started the project called page 21, uh, changing permafrost in the Arctic and its global effects in the 21st century. And their, their main goals were physical science um, to kind of get a pan Arctic view of permafrost, the role of permafrost globally in the climate and to integrate um, estimates of permafrost thaw and also the carbon coupling into earth system modeling so that we could also include permafrost in our projections for what's going to happen in the future. They managed to do that. They, they had produced uh, uh, tallies of how much carbon there is stored in permafrost and, they, and, and a timeline for the mobilization of this carbon and really highlighted the fact that that carbon once released feeds back into the greenhouse effect and, and exacerbates warming. That project ended in 2016, 15, 16. And um, in 2017, a, a further consortium was created to study permafrost, funded this time by Horizon 2020 by the EU, to look at permafrost thaw. And this time, the focus went from physical science more into the direction of socioeconomic adaptation to looking at how permafrost is important to people, um, to understand the dimensions of change in terms of humans. And so that includes in this project, which is still running, we're studying the global uh, to local scale social economics of permafrost thaw. And we're really starting to engage um, or engaging with communities, uh, people who are living on permafrost. And there's a focus, especially because so many of those people live along the Arctic coastline, a focus on coastal processes within Nunatariq. Nunatariq itself means land to sea. And so it's a, fo a focus, the name uh, reflects that focus on the coastal interface. This is a map of the partners, 26, uh, I think actually 28 now, partners who are involved in the, or partnered in the project. Um, and the sites that we work at are um, focused on Svalbard and then on the uh, Northwest part of North America. We have uh, Greenland, we call it the Nordic countries, the Svalbard and Greenland part. And we had a focus as well on Eastern Siberia. One of the products uh, that's come out of this project 
um, already is a, is a new map of permafrost distribution. The different colors here on land, the different brown tones give you an idea of how continuous permafrost is. But we also looked at permafrost beneath the Arctic Ocean. The green colors here give you an idea of the thickness um, of the permafrost and its distribution, mostly in Siberia, uh, beneath the Arctic Ocean. A part of the permafrost um, cryosphere component about which we don't know enough. This is a, an example of one of the mapping products coming out of the, out of the uh, project. We also produced a, um, an atlas of social economic um, data and information um, in uh, by Norregio, looking at uh, indicators of of the state of the Arctic uh, in 2019. It's really a focus on on people and on economies. As an example, um, here's a, a map of infrastructure and. Um, this is actually the result of uh, remote sensing, so looking at satellite data to track the spread of expanding infrastructure. And Nicole mentioned this as well, um, how much infrastructure in the Arctic is actually located on permafrost. So we can take a look at what the human footprint looks like in terms of, of the land cover and how it's changing over time. And the message here is that infrastructure is expanding. Well, we can already look down uh, the future, kind of the next few decades, and calculate how much of that infrastructure, which was built on permafrost, will have to deal with thawing permafrost in the, in the next in the coming dec decades. That's associated with a socioeconomic cost as well. We also looked at the population um, on permafrost. This is a map of uh, of settlement size from from small uh, villages up to cities located on permafrost in dark brown. And the indigenous population, the percentage of indigenous population is shown by hatching in the background. And then by a region, we have color bars that show you how many people within each region live um, on continuous permafrost versus just sporadic or discontinuous permafrost. So this gives you an example of the way that we're kind of looking at a larger scale, trying to look at the interactions between uh, humans and, and permafrost. We focus on physical pro properties as well, for example, on coastal erosion and how that's going to be changing, how it is changing, uh, we've updated, and how it's going to be changing. This is work from uh, David Nielsen, looking at a projection of erosion rates uh, for into the future and showing that um, there's a high likelihood that we're actually going to be emerging from a kind of an envelope of erosion that we have seen, a variability in erosion that we've seen, into a, a, a much faster rates of erosion that exceed the, the range of variability that we've seen in the past. This is a, one reflection of a physical process um, as a result, of course, of ocean side processes, but also of warming of the permafrost. And we see warming of the permafrost actually everywhere in the landscape in the Arctic, especially where the permafrost is ice rich. Uh, people who live there say that the landscape um, as they know it uh, is on the move, that there's a, a new dynamics coming into um, the landscape surface. Here's an example of a, of a picture from Canadian colleagues, actually, they put out a beautiful story map on um, on erosion. This, this takes a look at ice rich uh, permafrost. You can see that there are thaw uh, features here eating their way into the landscape. And what happens there is that sediment, but also carbon, potentially also contaminants are suddenly mobilized and uh, set free and released into waterways and ultimately to the Arctic Ocean. This is a fundamental shift in ecosystems, um, as, the, as the IPCC synthesis points out, and it's irreversible, I think, on any time scale that's relevant to humans. Plants and animals we see are already reacting as uh, vegetation is shifting and uh, different species are expanding into the north, especially at the moment, beavers, for example. And we encounter a new geological phenomenon like blowout craters uh, that have shown up in, in Siberia that we didn't predict. Um, but that have uh, suddenly surprised us and which we have to account for. More importantly, I think, is that what this does is sets free release of carbon over a long term, which is something that Gustav will describe. Um, and that has implications because it changes how we have to budget our carbon emissions, um, not just in the next 10 years, but really over the next coming centuries. So the new Natalia project is trying to refine our estimates um, of this and put a price tag actually on the uncertainty that still remains in terms of if we reduce our uncertainty, how much money can we save in terms of uh, reducing our carbon emissions? Talking to the people who live here, 
we realize that there are different levels of risk that they are uh, faced with and uncertainty um, with respect to uh, infrastructure, with respect to health, with respect to contaminant release, um, and a number of other issues. And so one of the things that we've done um, within the project and with the communities that we work with, and this is something that Susan, Susan will talk more about, is to create a framework for talking about risk where scientists, um, stakeholders, rights holders, community members get together and can kind of find the overlap between their different perceptions of what's happening to the permafrost, identify risks, and start to talk about adaptation and mitigation uh, strategies. So final slide, um, as our project completes its work, this is our final year, there are going to be more products on societal and, and climate relevance of permafrost thaw. We are producing um, an atlas this year of permafrost, the first one, but there remains a, a critical need to, to anticipate future surprises and to somehow limit the risks that are associated with these longer term permafrost carbon feedbacks. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Paul, for this very nice introduction. Um, as I said before, we will um, entertain the question at the end of this webinar, and that's why we will move on to our next speaker directly. So this is Susanna Gartler from the Institute for Cultural and Social Anthropology in, at the University of Vienna. Susanna has been working in the field of social and cultural and anthropology in the Canadian Arctic for more than a decade. Uh, she's also part of the uh, Nunatayuk project in which she leads the social science work in the Beaufort Sea region in northwest um, Canada. Susan, uh, Susanna will talk about the relevance of permafrost to those living in the north, uh, community engagement and the relevant link between environmental change and people. Susanna, please. We are looking forward. Okay, uh, maybe just uh, one comment before we start. I've received notice of a colleague that she's having trouble checking in, like I did. So, yes. Same, same here. Yeah. Yes, yes. So I sent him the password, but some, for some people it works, for others not. I don't know why. But we, I will send an email afterwards that we recorded it and um, yeah, directed the link to the YouTube. Yeah. Okay, um, so then I will share my screen. Yes, uh, welcome everybody. I will uh, talk a little bit about social science aspects. Um, as was mentioned, um, I am an anthropologist at the University of Vienna. I prepared this um, presentation together with my colleague Alex Meyer. Um, and uh, yeah, we're both um, also part of the Austrian Polar Research Institute, and I'm happy to be here today. Um, so speaking of permafrost thaw and Arctic communities, um, first of all, it is very important to mention that there's um, very large differences between um, the places, different places within the Arctic and subarctic. Um, and um, also permafrost itself is, of course, extremely varied and place specific. Um, so we always need to keep in mind that um, context and conditions vary greatly across the Arctic. Um, social sciences, uh, as well as inter and transdisciplinarity, however, are uh, seem to be very much um, appreciated locally. So this kind of approach, um, uh, because historically and presently, there is being much more natural science um, done or permafrost is looked at from that um, perspective. However, there's a great need for local communities to understand holistically what is going on um, where they live. And um, there is both a need for general and as well as specific knowledge um, to reduce uncertainties and to successfully adapt to changing conditions um, in terms of, for example, infrastructure, but also food security and mobility. Um, and I will talk about that a little bit more. Um, but uh, first, I want to mention that in a metaphorical sense, as my colleague Susan Crate has said, we all live on permafrost um, because the consequences of permafrost thaw are affecting um, not only Arctic residents, but um, people across the world. So um, looking at this physical phenomenon, these physical phenomena, um, 
from many different angles, opens, um, has the possibility or the, the, the capability to open our eyes to the manifold ways in which all of our lives are affected by thawing grounds. Um, okay. Yeah, so now to uh, to the five key hazards of permafrost thaw. So within the Nunataruk project, we have conducted an extensive um, risk analysis. We've gathered information from all the um, inter different um, disciplines and work packages, and we have spoken to uh, many, many different um, yeah, stakeholders and residents across the Arctic. And our, um, our conclusion was that these are sort of the five key, I would say, potential hazards of permafrost thaw. So there's infrastructure failure, um, which is very important. There's, there's, there's exposure to infectious diseases and contaminants, which uh, Paul mentioned already. Um, there is a possible disruption of mobility and supplies. There's challenges for food security, and there's a potential decrease in water quality of, of, um, as well. And of course, these hazards, um, so why are they hazards? Because they're, um, they're linked to, they can be linked uh, more or less directly to physical processes um, connected to permafrost thaw. But then in turn, um, these key hazards have impacts on a variety of um, what we call life domains. Um, so for example, culture, heritage, and language, health and well-being, um, economy, planning, um, recreation and being in nature, um, ecosystem health. Um, yeah. And of course, it is very important to keep in mind as well that all of these um, hazards and domains, life domains, are very much interlinked. Um, so there's, we are not seeing those as separate, um, but there, yeah, there's many interactions between these different aspects. Um, yeah, we have also conducted, we've conducted a survey um, in uh, three different sites in, in the Arctic, one in Aklavik in the Northwest Territories in Canada, one in Longyearbyen on Svalbard um, in northern Norway, and one in Kekartarsvak um, in um, Northwest Greenland. Um, and this, the results of our survey show very clearly that permafrost thaw um, is seen as a um, has has a very relevant impact. A negative is seen as a negative impact on Arctic um, communities. In all these three cases, um, you can see on the left on the left hand side, for example, um, yeah, people say um, a majority of people say that uh, the thawing of the frozen ground has led to negative changes. Um, yeah, and uh, on the right hand side, you can see that especially in Aklavik in the Northwest Territories, um, that the thawing of the frozen ground causes problems to um, people individually and their communities. But also in Long Yerbean, it's nearly 50% and um, a significant amount of people in Katarsuak as well. Um, yeah, this is another graph from um, this survey, and uh, it shows that um, again, permafrost thaw has um, negative impacts on infrastructure, subsistence, culture, health, um, the physical environment, and economic activities. However, results um, are varied um, across uh, these three communities. Uh, for example, Long Longyear being on Svalbard has no um, indigenous population, um, whereas in Aklavik, for example, um, is 95% indigenous. Um, the Gwich'in First Nation and Inuvialuit. Uh, so for Aklavik, for example, if you look at subsistence uh, activities, so hunting, fishing, gathering, whaling, trapping, and so on, uh, nearly 100% of respondents um, said that uh, permafrost thaw is, is posing challenges in that um, domain. Yeah, um, then we're also looking at adaptation and mitigation uh, measures. Of course, there's a large variety um, that um, are um, and can be de um, taken in the local context. Uh, the one on the right hand side, which is darker green, greenhouse gas emission and other contaminant emission reduction, obviously is one that applies to um, a more global context. Um, and in this uh, regard, the concept of equitable mitigation is very important 
um, equitable mitigation means that uh, basically Arctic residents themselves can do very little about reducing global greenhouse gas emissions, even if several projects are ongoing in terms of energy transition, for example, um, but their coupled socio-ecological environments suffer disproportionately from the effects. So it is very important that mitigation is being done equitably and that um, more is being done by um, the um, yeah, uh, places further south where there's um, more carbon and, and uh, greenhouse gases emitted into the atmosphere. Yeah, uh, there's several topics um, that really lend themselves to um, employ an inter and transdisciplinary lens, uh, for example, tangible cultural heritage. So, for example, old mining camps on Svalbard or um, uh, old camps um, in along the coast, um, along the Yukon coast in Canada. Um, yeah, mining, oil and gas and extractive industries is also something um, that where permafrost is relevant and that obviously has an environmental and a social um, relevance. And of course, permafrost itself. So um, the question here is what does permafrost mean to people? Um, and uh, I will speak about that a little bit more later on. Uh, what is very important to note is that uh, the applicability of science and the relevance of science is very, very important um, to local people. So if you are doing a research project in the Arctic, um, it is really important to think about what um, what could be the uh, a direct or, or, an, or at least an indirect um, benefit for the local population. And this adds, of course, also to the um, uh, to the relevance of the projects and to the acceptance as well. And it combats research fatigue, for example, when people can clearly see what the added benefit to um, themselves is from from research projects. Yeah, then we also believe that social scientists are in a very good position to identify knowledge gaps within communities because um, we talk to a lot of people. That is our main job. Um, so, yeah, we got a very good insight of what um, what is what the knowledge base is within a community within different uh, for different stakeholders and um, what kind of knowledge is needed. Um, finally, also funding should be in place to enable um, co-design and co-production and the building of long-term relationships, um, which of course is needed to to um, yeah produce uh, benefits uh, in terms of science for Arctic residents. And mutual capacity building is also something I wanted to mention. Um, so scientists uh, should, and um, in many cases, also do bring capacity to to communities. But it should also be noted that um, vice versa, scientists profit from um, local knowledge, from indigenous knowledge, from the help and support of many um, stakeholders and Arctic residents. And it's um, very important to acknowledge this, this mutual capacity building that it actually goes two ways. Um, yeah, knowledge transfer is extremely important. This, of course, has to do with um, capacity building as well. Um, knowledge transfer uh, in terms of permafrost thaw um, is important, for example, when it comes to indigenous or um, other elders being able to tell youth and teach youth how to move on the land um, safely, which places to go to. Uh, for example, I've, we've been told in Canada during my field work that nowadays the ground becomes so soft, there's places that are um that that resemble like something like quicksand so you have to be really careful when you're out on the land driving, driving with your atv for example um as to not get into those areas because you, because you can literally get sucked into the ground because it's become so soft um but there's also the issue of knowledge transfer between for example engineers and construction experts um and relevant stakeholders such as cabin owners private individuals or companies so there's really, really a gap um, and a really a big need, a huge need for um, more effective knowledge transfer um, here as well uh, to combat all a variety of construction issues. And of course, permafrost increased permafrost thaw doesn't make um, construction easier in many cases. Um, so yeah, this is very important in the local context as well. 
And then the third uh, that I noted here was scientists to local stakeholders, such as regional and local planners. So um, regional and local planners really need um, uh, specific information from scientists, for example, as to the conditions of the permafrost in certain areas of communities um, to be able to, to plan for building and construction. Um, in order to make that happen, more, many more knowledge sharing initiatives and dialogue um, is necessary. Uh, we have recently conducted three workshops in Greenland, in Canada, in the North, um, in Inuvik Aklavik in Canada, and on in Longyearbyen on Svalbard, where we invited local stakeholders and we presented our own knowledge and we had this kind of dialogue um, with communities and it was very, very well received. Um, so there's obviously a big um, need for that kind of dialogue uh, within Arctic communities as well. Um, yeah, a good example in this regard, if, if you're interested, is the Perma Metro Community Project, which is a collaborative project on Svalbard, um, defined by knowledge needs from society, and there's the link there if you want to check that out. Um, yeah, there's other projects um, related to permafrost thaw with social, cultural, health related and or engineering aspects. Um, of course, in Otariuk, but there's also a, a couple of cultural heritage projects um, on Svalbard. There's a variety of mapping and monitoring projects um, where the societal relevance is also very important and highlighted from the NWT. Um, yeah, there's um, more um, like Arctic wide. Uh, there's a sustaining Arctic observing networks and roads and Arctic passion. So there's, uh, um, yeah, and finally also sh the shared Arctic variables um, that are, are interested in interesting um, if you're, if you want to know more about what's going on at the moment. Uh, yeah, so finally, a few main takeaways. Um, we know a lot about permafrost and permafrost thaw, um, although the knowledge that is needed for local communities um, to su successfully adapt is sometimes not there yet, or it is not well communicated. So there's a very big need to communicate knowledge better, both within communities, with, um, between scientists and communities. Um, yeah, and... Uh, um, yeah, this really can't be stressed enough, I think. And the challenge is to get this knowledge to the ones who need it for public and private building and construction, for example, and for rural and urban planning, administration, et cetera. And like we said earlier, to reduce uncertainties as well in terms of, for example, water quality. When people get nervous about their water quality, for example, um, that's that's really it's it's good to have uh, to have more detailed knowledge whether there's an whether there's an impact of permafrost thaw and the same counts for of course infectious diseases and contaminants. Um, yeah, so with that, there's a uh, strong uh, there's a big need for collaboration, knowledge sharing, and dialogue between society uh, and science. And with that, I would like to um, pass it on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Susanna, for this very interesting overview. Um, let's move on for the next and last speaker. This is Gustav Ugelius from Stockholm University. Gustav is also the vice director of the Bolin Center for Climate Research. His main scientific interest is the role of soils in the global carbon cycle. And um, he uh, strives to increase our understanding of climate cryosphere interactions in different northern regions. Gustav will now re outline the relevance of permafrost for the global climate change context. Thank you, Gustav, and it's your turn now. Thank you. So do you see my slides okay? Yeah. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Nicole, and uh, yeah, thank you to the audience, to those of you that managed to find us. Uh, I'm going to be talking about permafrost and its role in the global climate, so really broad brushstrokes uh, on that topic. Uh, it's been introduced a little bit already by the previous speakers, and then also sort of use that, you know, that topic to discuss future research needs and, and priorities that we see sort of emerging from, from, from what we know and what, what we don't know. Uh, So I liked, I really like like this image. It's it shows thawing permafrost along the Canadian coast, and you see. Uh, let me, uh, 
Hi, you see a, a professor from Avi here for scale. Uh, this this image I just have it here to illustrate the thawing of permafrost and sort of the 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 really drastic effects that it can have. And of course, we've heard a little bit about this already. Global warming thaws permafrost. Uh, from either the top down or from the side. Uh, and then you have an impact to ecosystems, to infrastructure, to human activities. We heard a lot about that. And also we have an impact to the global climate because as, uh, as permafrost starts to decay, the organic matter that's been built up over millennia is available for microbes to decompose it and greenhouse gases are released. Mainly CO2 and methane, but also a little bit of nitrous oxide added to the mix. Um, and that has potential sort of global ramifications precisely because the permafrost system is so large and it contains so much organic carbon. So this, this sort of scale of the problem is a little bit somewhat proportional to, to the scale of the permafrost in this image. Um, so basically the reason why we are so concerned with thawing permafrost is because of the size of the permafrost carbon pool. That is the number of how much carbon we think is stored in the permafrost region. This is a figure from a report that came out now a few years ago, by a colleague that summarized the globally relevant or uh, carbon pools in sort of in the in the climate system. You have the atmosphere that is approaching 900. This is gigatons of carbon, so a billion tons of carbon. It's approaching 900 gigatons in the atmosphere. All the vegetation on Earth is a little bit more than 500. The soils are the largest, so the largest global pool of, of, of carbon that is active at the timescales that we're discussing now. And then there are other pools uh, that are turnover at slower timescales and longer timescales that are even larger. But within the soil carbon pool of more than 3000 gigatons or petagrams, the permafrost region is almost half of that. So it's less than 20% of the global soil surface, but it has half of the soil carbon. And out of that, a thousand gigatons roughly is in frozen ground with potentially even more in unaccounted deep sediments. So permafrost holds more frozen carbon than what we have in the full atmosphere right now. And because some of this carbon, certainly not all of it, but some of it will be released when the permafrost thaws, this is then an issue for the global climate. Uh, and I want I want to phrase sort of frame this talk a little bit in the context of the last IPCC report. So I will show you some figures of, of from that report. Uh, these are from uh, the Working Group One report, uh, and one of the findings, sort of the crucial findings of that in the report, is that the natural sinks of the Earth system are weakening and changing depending on which scenario, which sort of emission pathway hum humanity follows. As it is right now, and as it has been in the past, roughly half of the carbon that we emit is actually reabsorbed by the Earth system, either the ocean or the land. Uh, and if you look at this figure, the, the carbon that would be reabsorbed is in these sort of colored bars, and then the rest would stay in the atmosphere. And then you have different scenarios from very low emission scenarios to high emission scenarios. Uh, and as you see, the proportion of the human emissions that are reabsorbed by the Earth systems are quite high in the low emission scenarios, but these sinks start to saturate, and in the high emission scenarios, the Earth system can't keep up. It can't absorb all of this carbon. And the further bad news is that probably the IPCC report here is underestimating the permafrost carbon feedback, which would make this land component even smaller. Uh, so that is what I'm sort of going to continue talking about now. Uh, um, Gustav, sorry to interrupt yes. you, but um, we cannot see your pr presentation uh, properly. Is, are you in presenters mode? Maybe it's 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 quite small. Oh, okay. No, I'm not in presenters mode. Uh, let's see if I. So no, uh, now I think you see it in presenters mode. Okay, but it's bigger yeah. now, so that's definitely better. So so what? Uh, oh no! Now maybe... it's back to this is good. Yeah. Yeah, this is actually we're seeing your your PowerPoint window. Yeah, now, so that's not quite right. There's for some reason let it gets small. Uh, let me try this. Cancel set up slideshow and present the browse by an individual. Perhaps is this better? This is very good. Yeah, that's okay. Great. Then then we'll do it this way. Um 
Okay, sorry, uh, now I'm getting lost my train of thought. So uh, here we're looking at a figure that is cropped from the last IPCC report that shows which carbon cycle climate feedbacks are included by the Earth system model that the IPCC ha has had access to in the last two rounds. And you see this really large carbon cycle feedbacks uh, linked between the global climate and the carbon that we emit. And here you see the two main cooling feedbacks, which is the land and ocean carbon response to increased CO2, which is essentially CO2 fertilization. Vegetation likes a lot of CO2, so it grows better. And here the ocean carbon response is uh, CO2 being dissolved into the ocean mainly. But then we also have land carbon responses to climate, so the actual warming itself, which increases decomposition, which is then in the red bars, which is a warming feedback. So we have cooling feedbacks and warming feedbacks that the models account for. Uh, which is good. You, you, you need these sort of feedback loops to be coupled to really be able to predict the future climate that we don't know that much about. But uh, no, no, so, no, one of my slides was hidden. No. But uh, unfortunately, some of the feedbacks are not yet included in the models that went to the IPCC, and this includes wetlands, fire, and permafrost. So those feedbacks alone might account for as much as 10% of the total human change in, 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 in radiative forcing. Now, even if the models don't have them uh, inherently in the IPCC uh, model in comparison, the IPCC still used the existing literature and did a relatively cautious estimate of the permafrost carbon feedback. And they concluded that some, somewhere between 14 and 177, so a really wide uncertainty range, gigatons of CO2 equivalents will be released for every degree of global warming. And they included that in estimated remaining human carbon budgets. So this figure shows us for different degrees of global warming, 1.5, 2, and 4, how much the permafrost alone would emit over a long time uh, to the end of this century, to be more specific. So it's quite, it's quite substantial emissions already here that the IPCC are, are projecting. Now, unfortunately, as I mentioned, this is the rather sort of cautious estimate. And there are processes that were not fully included in the IPCC estimates. Uh, the most important of those, uh, I would argue, would be local scale tipping points uh, or processes called abrupt thaw processes, also called, called thermocarts processes in, in, in permafrost science. And this is basically things that happen not everywhere across the permafrost landscape, but locally. And it's very strongly coupled to the existence of massive ground ice. So you see a photograph here of some scientists that are pondering a piece of massive ground ice in Siberia. Uh, and this is just a corner of a huge ice wedge. And in a lot of places in permafrost, more than half of the volume below the ground is actually made, made out of pure ice. And it can be even more than that. And so what happens when this ice melts and drains away is that the land surface actually collapses because you lose so much volume. So the little graph on top shows the success successively as you lose an ice wedge, how the ground surface is subsiding. And the photograph at the bottom shows a stable permafrost pitland and a collapsed permafrost pitland to the left and the right. So when the ground ice disappears, you have this collapse and this fundamental change of the ecosystem, all of its properties. And this change also leads to quite large greenhouse gas emissions from this post thaw environment, especially a lot of methane that comes out in the sort of decades, centuries after thaw. And there is I would say now still only one sort of model-based estimate that projects abrupt thaw into the future, uh, but that points to it adding significantly to the projected emissions. So if we take IPCC assessments and add abrupt thaw, we get these purple dots, which is a much more dire message than what we saw earlier. Um, and I also want to draw your attention to the little figure on the right-hand side. It says 1.5 degree remaining budget, and there's a little line there. That just shows us the total remaining emission budget we have to stay below 1.5 degrees, which is roughly 500 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. Um, so in the high warming scenarios, the permafrost alone will actually eat up all of that budget. Now it's important to note that the permafrost emissions will happen over centuries, while this remaining re budget to say below 1.5 is something that we're talking about in the coming decades with human emissions. So the timescales are different, but it's just to think about the amount of carbon that it can, can potentially emit. Uh, another important issue that was not really explicitly at least dealt with by the IPCC report is something called overshoot warming and permafrost thaw. So overshoot warming is 
the process by, you know, if we think that we, we don't want to reduce our emissions very quickly, rather we would keep emitting for a while longer, so use cheap coal or whatever to still have our energies, our economies grow, and then we would overshoot the warming, and then later on we would use negative emission technologies, whether they be different land use or the different types of, 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 of technologies we have that might pull CO2 out of the air. Uh, and then we would use those technologies that are not yet scalable and don't really exist at that scale, but we'd use them in the future to pull the warming back down. So that's the red curve you see, while the green curve is a sort of better way forward where we would have rapid emission reductions to reach the target temperature directly. Now, there are two problems associated with overshoot warming and permafrost thaw. The first problem is that because permafrost drives even further warming, higher than what we are currently projecting, we will actually overshoot even more. So you see this shading I've added both in the green and the red that will make us overshoot the target even worse. And then the second problem is that actually a lot of the permafrost loss will be irreversible, at least at the policy relevant timescales. So a lot of the warming that occurs while we are in overshoot warming world, the permafrost that's thawed at that time, it won't just refreeze when we pull back down. It will keep emitting CO2 and methane for several centuries, certainly locking us into a future of, of you know, sustained high emissions from the permafrost region, even if we pull back down to warming. Uh, so if we add that uh, to our graph again, and here now you're looking at Purple is no overshoot, and then yellow is overshoot of a half a degree, and red is overshoot of one degree. That substantially increases the, the added emissions that we can expect from permafrost. Again, this is from basically one model run, um, a simplistic model. So it's, you know, it's an indicator of our, our, our best abilities to, to assess this now. But of course, a lot more research is needed to really understand the complexities of such, such trajectories, because they have not been carefully studied so far. Uh, and I also want to go to, uh, and this is again a section from the IPCC report where they have this section they call frequently asked questions, which actually has a lot of very good material. And one of the frequently asked questions they have there is, could climate change be reversed by removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? So negative emission technologies. Uh, and here you see the sort of scenario the IPCC used to answer this question, where you have a strong CO2 peak and then a strong C and then a rapid decline again. Uh, and their question, their answer is that. Yes, the warming itself can be removed, but there or reverse, I should say, but there's a lag time of a few years. For instance, here is global surface temperature change after such a CO2 peak. So a lag time of years. And in another context, they asked, yes, it's partly reversible, but here they, they, they say that for permafrost area, there's a lag time of decades. And I actually think that the models are overestimating how quickly it would regrow. So I would say that it's closer to centuries, actually, but that's uh, debatable. Um, and then for yet other processes, they say that no, it's not reversible, at least not for centuries or millennia. An example of that is ocean thermal expansion. Another example that is very relevant to the Arctic is ocean acidification, which will happen very rapidly in Arctic waters, and that is also basically irreversible. Uh, and another thing that is, that is important to note here is that if we go back to the permafrost slide here, and they said, okay, it's reversible over decades, but we still have a massive difference in the permafrost area. So we land at an area of minus five million square kilometers of, of, of permafrost at a sustained level. And then all of that lost permafrost between the zero and minus five will remain thawed and will keep emitting carbon. So if we also look at the long-term responses of the permafrost ecosystems to thaw, we also see that we are the permafrost we thaw now, we're committed to emissions from that permafrost for several centuries. And we know this by studying sort of paleo landforms, landforms that we know thawed in the past and how for how long they emit CO2 and methane. So we, even if we cap warming at 20, by, by, by 2100 to 1.5, 2 or 4, this second dotted line or the point, the second set of purple dots and dotted lines here show the sustained emissions we have all the way until 2300, even if we stop warming. Uh, and this essentially commits several future generations of humanity to have to use negative emission technologies to keep the, 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 the radiator balance of Earth because permafrost will keep emitting under the damage that we do to it right now. Um, so if I summarize sort of permafrost star impact to climate, we are already committed to profound permafrost star impact to climate and Arctic communities that will affect several future generations. And there's no going back from that. We are, we are already there. The question is how much 
damage wouldn't do. Uh, so we know that permafrost thaw further reduces the remaining human emission budgets with strong effects, especially from 2100 and beyond, affecting multiple generations. Abrupt thaw processes are, we know that they are, you know, a concern. We don't know them well enough to, to have them included in all the Earth system models, but they create local scale irreversible tipping points that transform ecosystems, damage infrastructure, and greatly increase warming. And we know that overshoot warming needs to be avoided. It will trigger irreversible permafrost thaw that drives additional warming for centuries, even after the climate stabilizes. And there are other Earth system feedback that would also be irreversibly damaged under overshoot warming. Ice sheets, uh, for instance, that could trigger quite substantial irreversible sea level rise as well. Uh, and global warming is reversible by removing CO2 from the atmosphere, but a lot of the feedbacks will persist for centuries to millennia. So even if we can, re can, re can reverse the warming, we can't reverse some of the damage that we do to the Earth system. Uh, and the last point here I want to point out is that the vast difference between the numbers that were reported in the IPCC report and the numbers that I showed you that include abrupt thaw overshoot on the long-term perspective, they really highlight research needs and priorities for the purpose community and things that we need to know better to include better into models and then make, you know, give better policy advice on, on exactly how much uh, CO2 and methane will come from permafrost in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Gustav. Very interesting thought. Not in general, always with positive messages, no. but that's the case. So um, uh, I would like to thank all three speakers, Susanna, Gustav and Paul, and I will also ask the audience if there are any questions. So please, if you have questions, then type them into the chat. Um, there is a Aha, I have a question here. So uh, the question comes from Uc Plantui, and it's a question to all three of you. Uh, so uh, the EU released a new Arctic policy a little while ago with a major focus on permafrost. Concurrently, the Commission announced new projects on permafrost and pollution and impacts on small coastal communities. In your mind, now comes the question. What is missing in the EU palette of projects to answer societal needs and the questions of these policies in particular? Um, anybody who would like to answer the question of UK? Gustav? Yeah, I think it's, um, as, you, as you mentioned, and I think as both the Unicorn and Paul have mentioned as well, that, that, I mean, the, the, the EU uh, polar st strategy does mention permafrost quite a lot. Uh, and I think that, I, mean, I think the, uh, the perspectives on, uh, on the increased risk to the global climate and the fit, you know, the increased long-term risk to, to the climate. And, uh, and I think also Paul mentioned this, some of the work that is being pioneered in, in the monetary, actually figuring out what is the, what is the monetary value of knowing these questions better. And I think that you know, realizing that constraining our uncertainties here is is also good makes good business sense. That we just we need to know these massive uncertainties much better to be able to plan for them. And uh, so I think that project that would link improved understanding of the processes in general, also with you know tying that to something like in integrated assessment models that really also assess the financial damage and that start at least to include you know cost of sea level rise and. I also still really lack a long ter long term perspective, like in the IPCC discussions and in policy in general, people still talk, talk about 2100 as if it's the distant future. And my, my children will certainly be alive, I hope, in 2100. It's not the distant future anymore. We need to think of 2300 and 2500 as the distant future uh, and really, you know, start seeing, uh, also, also realizing the Im immense amount of time that it will take to sort of change and adapt society to some of the potential changes we're seeing. Thank you, Gustav. Paul? Thanks very much, Gustav. You covered, I think, a lot of the things I would have said. Maybe one, one more aspect, which we none of us really talked about, are some of, um, some of the surprises that may be in store. Permafrost also has this function of, of trapping greenhouse gas, of confining greenhouse gas within it and, and below it. 
and the, the craters that I mentioned in in Siberia are one indication that some of this gas is starting to mobilize and there's um, not yet indications that 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 we're making massive contributions to the atmosphere from this trapped gas and we don't have a good idea of how much there is um, and how stable it is and so there's there's a potential there for um, a risk. It's a small one, but it's the 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 consequences could be huge um, if there's a, a large gas amount of gas there. So I would say that there are some kind of deep uncertainties still associated with permafrost, um, and those would be things that I think would be worth looking more at. The the idea being how much uh, gas is there, how stable is it, and especially what role do uh, microbes play in mitigating that risk. Thank you, Paul. Um, I also have a question for Susanna. Uh, it comes from Anna Maria Ilgang, and she would like to know um, if you could explain what issues are summarized under health when you are talking about impacts of permafrost. Thaw. You are muted still, or um, I at least cannot hear you. Thank you for your question, Anna. Um, our um, the health scientists within our group um, employed a one health approach. So that means um, not only physical health is uh, is included, but also health, um, spiritual health, uh, environmental health. Um, so it's a really very holistical. Um, uh, understanding of health and um, when it comes specifically to permafrost thaw, um, of course, there's um, and there's contaminants and infectious diseases um, that are a big uh, concern um, more in at least um, in Svalbard and in, in Canada that I can say that um, it's it's more the uncertainty that is posing um, uh, that is, yeah, creating a concern. It's not um, so much the um, contaminants and the infectious diseases themselves. Um, another issue is mold in Canada, for example, which is um, linked to permafrost and, and infrastructure failure, actually. Um, but of course, this is also, it's tying into larger um, themes such as um, the state of infrastructure itself, um, how much is invested in it, um, uh, engineering practices, and so on. Um, does that answer your question, more or less? I guess so. Otherwise, I think Anna Maria, okay. yeah, she says thank you. So then I have a question for Gustav. Um, and the question is also from Anna Maria, and it's about is there research on forecasting potential areas of future abrupt thawing? Uh, for example, to better estimate if there are increased risk for some communities. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, there, there is there is certainly research uh, on that topic uh, at the local scale. I think it is happening in a lot of different places at the panarctic scale. It is challenging because. Uh, to project abrupt thaw, we need to know how much ice is in the ground. I mentioned that, that the massive ice is so important, and the ground ice maps are still, they are getting a lot better in some, especially regional efforts, but still at the Panarctic scale, we don't know it well enough to make detailed maps. But with that said, there is a, a, quite an active research uh, project and group around uh, Jan Jok in Finland that has published some really nice Panarctic papers showing projections of, of, of uh, potential infrastructure hazard and risk into the future, integrating ice maps with infrastructure maps and so properties and climate projections so that there are panarctic maps of, of infrastructure at risk. But they could be a lot better if we had better maps of ground ice, which needs uh, a targeted effort of the, sort of a large enough project that can pull all of the different threads of evidence together to, 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 to really make improved ground ice maps, which would be an immense help to the research. Thank you. Uh, I have no questions in the chat anymore, um, but I have one last question for all of you three. And uh, as you know, um, um, this webinar was based on EU projects, yeah, so funded by the European uh, uh, Union. That's why my last question, and I ask all three of you to give a short answer is, when you are speaking with the EU citizen, 
yeah um and you are asked what effects permafrost ha thaw has on the life in the EU. So not only in the Arctic, but also for us here in Germany or wherever we are based. What would you answer? Paul, are you starting? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I think that we've already kind of answered this question. My, I would say that we as a society globally, but especially also the EU, we need to reduce our carbon emissions. And this is what the IPCC synthesis report yesterday really underscored. The time frame on which we have to do that is extremely short. And so there needs to be massive investment. And the question is really, how much is that going to cost? Um, and, and so I think the relevance uh, is kind of um, of permafrost research is to, for us to um, reduce our costs by knowing how much we need to, uh, what, what the pathway is to zero emissions. Okay. Anybody else who has a comment on that? I think it's a really good answer. I, th I think we can just add that because we know that permafrost is, is driving, you know, all of the negative impacts of climate change, permafrost tower leads to you know, all of the negative effects we're already seeing. The, you know, the heat waves that are plaguing Europe, the droughts, the floods, the sea level rise, the extremely negative effects for other parts of the world that in turn affects us and our economy. Um, so unfortunately, it's linked to all of that. And we do also have some EU citizens that live on permafrost as well that are very directly affected, of course. Okay. I see everybody, no further question. Everybody seems to be satisfied and we have already also overspent our estimated time. That's why I would like to thank you for the very interesting contributions. I think the audience those at least who managed to log in and uh, i want to wish you a nice afternoon so thank you all um and have a nice day thank you thank you bye bye, thank you. bye, -bye. bye.